<sighs> all right, so I guess I'm the uh, last one for the day, uh, and uh, I really appreciate all the talks that came ahead. Uh, I think one of the things that's fun is that being last means I get to riff a little bit off of like things that folks have already said. Um, <coughs> so um, yeah, uh, I'm Casey O'Donnell. Uh, I'm uh, technically from Michigan State University, uh, so I'll kind of start there. Um, <coughs> Uh, so one of the things uh, uh, Michigan State University uh, in the U.S., uh, our undergrad program is predominantly a game design and development program, uh, 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 and uh, we do pretty good at that for being uh, a public institution in the middle of the United States because uh, game making is uh, largely a kind of coastal uh, thing in the United States. Uh, particularly for the, the top-ranked universities, and so we always feel pretty good uh, for being in the middle of, uh, of the country. Um, <coughs> so uh, that's the good thing. Uh, the uh, one thing I did uh, want to note uh, is that uh, 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 collectively, uh, Michigan State University uh, does occupy uh, ancestral, traditional, uh, and contemporary lands of the Ashinaabe, uh, the Three Fires Confederacy of o uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples, um, and so uh, Michigan State University is on unceded territory, um, and so I like to uh, kind of start there. Um, so why am I here in Finland? Um, so uh, I actually have uh, uh, been to uh, Finland uh, five times before I decided to uh, come here. So I'm actually a, a Fulbright scholar um, at uh, Tampere University uh, in Tampere, and uh, so I've been here for, uh, I like to say I've been in Finland for this long, where the uh, uh, pink sort of fades out because I was purple when I arrived here, I was about this purple, and so now I'm about this pink, and I've been in Finland this long, which is about six months. Um, I, uh, like I said, I am a Fulbright uh, scholar. Uh, Fulbright Finland, uh, if you don't know about it, is a really um, impressive organization, um, and it was, uh, Finland was the country that uh, really was foundational for the formation of the f entire Fulbright program, and if you want to read about the history of it, it's pretty cool, um, and I, when I applied for uh, my scholar program here, I didn't know how cool it was, um, and then I found out, like, wow, this is a really uh, impressive program, uh, and so I like to, to acknowledge that. Um, uh, uh, like I said, uh, at Tampere University, part of the Center of Excellence, uh, it's great to have uh, Taina here as well. Um, yeah, so uh, in the interest of, so I, I study game makers, um, and that's kind of my thing, uh, the culture of game making, um, practices, um, I'm different, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but what I really care about is work and labor, and so I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Light lag, nope, backwards. Boop. Backwards, one more. No, forwards. You don't want to do it, do you? Go there. All right. So uh, <coughs> uh, I want to thank uh, my partner, Sam, uh, who uh, will hopefully join us at the social activities tonight. Um, I want to thank Doki, uh, who is uh, a free cat. Uh, that we dragged to Finland, uh, and uh, he's been doing quite well. It's quite an adjustment for uh, a free cat. Um, I think it's more of an adjustment for f Finnish folks um, to think about a free cat uh, than it actually was for Doki. Um, he's polydactyle. We call him murder paws. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, my kiddos. Uh, so you can see uh, my youngest gunning here, so it's not totally safe for work content. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to thank them because they had to uh, be okay with me coming to, to Finland uh, for a year, and it's been hard sometimes. Uh, but uh, And thanks to my co-parent, who has had to uh, really do a whole heck of a lot more when I go uh, back to the States to visit. Uh, I get a whole lot of, uh, you know, kids, and I'm going to go away and do th things. Uh, so, uh, uh, but also, uh, I want to, I have my Finnish Game Jam shirt on here. Uh, I've had a chance to actually make games here in Finland, and I, one of the things that sort of got me excited uh, about coming to Finland to study game making, and why I gave Taina a, a, a softball earlier, is because the game making culture here is very different uh, than the States, and that's part of 
why I wanted to come and look at it. And so uh, I got to participate in uh, the Global Game Jam and uh, worked on a game called Roll for Cookie, which if you know, Roll for Sandwich, sort of same sort of thing, but for cookies. Uh, and I also just came back uh, from Lapland where I got to see the Northern Lights, though I guess I, uh, uh, just the other night they were cited as low as Tampere. And so I was like, well, you know, I came up to Lapland and all of the uh, <coughs> Northern Lights came south. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you to family and friends and uh, my rainbow family back home. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that some of what I'm talking about uh, is uh, uh, work that uh, my colleague Oli uh, Soto uh, Sotoma uh, and I have been thinking about, which is that uh, <coughs> when folks, I'll get to Anna Kaiser here in a second, but uh, uh, when those of us that uh, took seriously the idea of uh, doing scholarly research, studying game making, um, when we first started that endeavor, um, We were considered, I mean, I, I got rejections from conferences because that was not science. Um, and uh, we were kind of outsiders, um, even from the field of game studies or media studies. Um, and, you know, not quite game makers, not quite proper games researchers. And so it was a really, I mean, it was an uphill battle to say studying game making matters. And, uh, and, and we said that and we were really loud about it. Um, and... We've been relatively successful, so uh, some of what I'm going to talk today is uh, 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 stuff that Oli and I have been working on. Um, I want to acknowledge Anna Kaiser's uh, part in this history as well, and I'm going to kind of talk about a handful of folks. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I was really, it was really funny, I was looking at your CV, and ga uh, games are made by people. So I, I'm going to talk about a talk that I gave, which is games are made of people, or it's kind of like the Soylent Green, yeah, but... So uh, we've been drinking the same Kool-Aid for, for quite a while, um, which is probably why I'm here. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, uh, so I also make games. Um, I'm part of uh, a uh, game collective, uh, Affinity Games. Um, if you want to know more about us, uh, you can just Google uh, Affinity Games and you can find it. Um, we had an Indie Arcade nominated game last year called Creative Dying is a conversation game about uh, death and dying, uh, and uh, collaborated with uh, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, who does research with uh, uh, psychedelics and terminally ill patients. And, uh, trust me, it's, it's actually not uh, uh, as sad as you might think it is. So, um, <clears throat> All right, so uh, one of the things that I, I, I always try to start off with is kind of where I come from. Uh, in terms of why I think studying game making is important. Um, my PhD is in science and technology studies, which most people are like, well, what does that mean? Uh, and it's anthropologists, sociologists, and historians who study scientists and science, right? Uh, and um, one of the early books, Science in Action by Bruno Latour, was, well, if you want to understand science, shouldn't you just go hang out with scientists and talk to them about making science because they do it. Wouldn't you want to talk to them? Um, <clears throat> you know, or if you want to understand like the history of bicycles, I don't know, like study the history of bicycles and talk to people who are making bicycles, right? Like if you want to understand the design decisions that are going into them. Um, and as the field of game studies was emerging, right, was coming about, there were just a handful of people being like, did anyone talk to a game maker? Right? Like we can do close readings of games, and I'm not saying that a close reading of a game is less important than uh, talking to a game maker. I'm not going to fall into the, uh, <coughs> the trap of uh, that uh, uh, you know, the, art, uh, uh, the artist's intent, right, is the only thing that matters, right, because art goes out and does thing in, things in the world. Um <coughs> but uh, I'm also really deeply informed um, by feminist studies uh, of science uh, or technoscience um, and right, really thinking, right, so these folks were, like I said, looking at the role of science and I view games as such an important medium that it's as important to you how our world gets shaped around us, just like science. Um, I'm also sort of informed uh, by a lot of 
theory and post-structuralist stuff. And so I try not to fall down a rabbit hole, but if I do, uh, if my writing sometimes is difficult to read, you can blame these folks. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about just the messiness of trying to understand uh, uh, what game making looks like, right? So when I think about your users, right, you're, you're sort of trying to prime a system and for people to then go play and explore in. Um, and that's really complicated and difficult to do. Uh, and to, to understand how those folks are then going to use it uh, is unpredictable and hard. And so I like to think about messiness. Um, <clears throat> this is my book. Uh, it came out in 2014. Um, it was uh, an ethnography, uh, which means I went and hung out for uh, two and a half years with uh, uh, game developers. I was at uh, the game studio of Vicarious Visions. They work on Destiny now and other things, but at the time they were working on Spider-Man 3, uh, and so you can go read that if you really want to. Um, but again, what brought me to Finland is this was just about a decade ago that this book came out, and I'm like, in the book, I sort of issued this challenge to game makers, which was, I don't know, learn how to cooperate better uh, and learn how to talk to each other better and share. And <laughs> I love the chuckles. Uh, and, uh, and, and, right, so, and it was framed in this sort of uh, prisoner's dilemma of, like, you know the solution is to cooperate, right? And American developers are really good at kicking each other under the bus. Uh, and so it's a decade later, and I said, you know, lots of things change. Uh, and, you know, and so now I'm asking that question, what's changed? But in particular, who are the folks that are trying to cooperate, do better, do different things? Um, and again, that's what sort of brought me to Finland. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so in... Uh, uh, 2015, I gave a keynote uh, at the Foundation of Digital Games conference, right, which tends to, to uh, lean um, a little bit um, HCI heavy, um, even more computer science. Um, and uh, at the very first Foundation of Digital Games conference, I submitted uh, the abstract for, for my dissertation. And um, I got two rejection letters. Uh, the first one was their automated rejection system was broken, and so it just said, dear author name here, your presentation presentation title here has been rejected. That was really cool. Um, so I at least knew what was coming, and then I got a second email that you know, basically said my dissertation was rejected, and uh, the reviews kind of called me not science, which was cool. Um, and so that was great. Uh, <coughs> but then... Uh, uh, you know, just about uh, uh, a decade later, I was there giving a keynote. And so uh, I feel like uh, for those of us studying game making, uh, right, we've gotten there. There's been an arrival, um, but it wasn't without a whole lot of taking our, our lumps uh, along the way. And so I made this argument that video games are made of people. Um, and unfortunately, it is kind of like a grinder um, for some folks, right? Hashtag not every game company, but um, not all game companies, but uh, right, that there is this squishing of human beings through the game industry um, that I find concerning. Um, and there's a lot of work out there that has been done on, right, so in academic circles, we call it political economy research. Um, and it's folks that will write and talk about uh, the game industry. Um, and uh, haven't spent a lot of time talking to game makers, um, right? You can say a lot, learn a lot, just by looking at the figures, news reports, uh, and things like that. Um, but I don't think it's the same, right? Because, so, I'm gonna show my age here. How many of you know of the EA Spouse Live Journal? Right, I know, I know. Okay, uh, you, you can go Google it and look at, uh, back on it. But um, uh, Aaron Hoffman is actually EA spouse. Uh, and uh, Aaron uh, is a friend of mine. And Aaron wound up at a game studio uh, literally a block away from my apartment uh, in upstate New York while I was in grad school. Uh, and I got to chat with Aaron and say, you know, talk to me about what's happened since 
uh, EA spouse and all of these things. And, and this, uh, this particular live journal uh, post uh, caused a huge uproar uh, in the studio that I was at while I was there, right? And so when I've, I, I saw other scholars, right, talking about EA spouse without ever talking to EA spouse, it made me feel weird, right? Like, this person, a real person you can go find and talk to. I mean, at first it was anonymous, so not really. But, uh, and it turns out, like, Aaron went on to do a bunch of uh, really great, uh, you know, back in the day it was called Quality of Life work for the International Game Developers Association, the IGDA. And, right, like, that's just not in a lot of those texts that just sort of, like, chuck EA spouse, um, you know, and, and I'm like, no, you need to talk to the folks that, that were there for that. Um, and so, you know, I'm at the, this weird point in my work where I kind of talk at a weird meta level about game production studies because I've been doing it for a while and I think it's a really important approach to studying games. Um, <clears throat> and um, I've studied AAA game makers, I've studied hobbyists, um, I've studied uh, indie game makers, right? Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I really hope somebody comes along and studies Roblox players, although getting permission to do that would be kind of hard because you're going to be talking to kids, right? Hash not all Roblox makers are kids, but there's a lot. Uh, and so that changes the, the ethical uh, review guidelines for your research. Um, <coughs> but I think game production studies is, as we've sort of, called it, or studio studies, developer studies, uh, uh, is a really important kind of area to look at. But I also want to just say that, like, there are a ton of pe people doing really awesome work, right, uh, in game production studies now, uh, and looking at different areas of the world, right? So Finnish game studies, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Finnish studio studies, uh, you know, production studies um, in other places. I uh, uh, Solip's work, uh, right, like looking at the transnational movement of labor, of workers, like there's such uh, impressive work that's really sort of coming out of uh, this entire ecosystem. And so I'm not taking credit for any of this. There's just a lot of amazing work. And I think a lot of game makers and, and folks don't really know how many researchers are out there sort of studying the game industry. There's no one game industry. It's like lots of different little game industries. Okay, <clears throat> um, it's also been really interesting um, to watch uh, attempted labor organizing in the game industry, right? So 2018 was this really interesting moment where Game Workers Unite, like, seemed to coalesce. I mean, it was really interesting because at the time, like, it sort of, like, it not sort of, it butted heads with the IGDA because, like, the IGDA was, like, quality of life, but not unions because... Companies don't like unions. Like, it was really weird. Ambiguous, Ambiguous. yes. <sighs> yes. And so, but then, of course, COVID happened. And in, in some ways, COVID might have been an opportunity for it. But I think a lot of game makers hunkered down because everybody was worried about their jobs. And so, right, and uh, I'll get to... Brendan Keogh uh, has an interesting article sort of about what he would call the collapse of Game Workers Unite. Like, um, I don't know if I want to put those words in his mouth. but um, And yet, at the same time, right, so it's been interesting for me. So the last time I was down in Helsinki was uh, <coughs> there was uh, the, the workers uh, walkout, um, the labor protests that happened, and uh, to see, you know, some game makers participating in that walkout and having an element of solidarity with other workers and other unions, uh, and that was really fascinating, and, and Taina was great to like help me decode that, and that was also f fascinating because later that night was an IGDA meeting. Uh, <coughs> so um, I also come from this world where I think it's really important to pay attention to like the work that people do, right? Like we kind of go through our lives and we don't think a lot about where the stuff comes from that we interact with every day. Uh, and so there's this great old book, uh, Tracy Kidder's uh, 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 
Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist uh, as about, uh, uh, I believe it was the Vax PDP, I forget which, but it was an early mainframe computer and it was about like the story of where it came from and just the goofiness of it, right? Like these weird nerds trying to make this thing. Um, and so these stories, right, so uh, Game Over uh, has some really fascinating stuff about uh, NES development that, like, no one else would have had access to. So, like, Miyamoto talking about, like, the tools that got used to make Mario. I'm like, the world needs to know uh, that these things are out there. But, like, uh, you know, uh, copier technicians, really smart folks, but... Companies think they're stupid, right? They're just dudes that kick around machines. Um, but no, like they have a lot of knowledge that gets lost, right? And so there's a lot of uh, complexity and expertise that goes into what we even think of as mundane things. But like when we think about making games, okay, so if you don't know, this is from the movie Grandma's Boy. It's a, not a good movie, especially if you're a game maker because you're like, oops, I did that. I touched the cord. There it goes. Uh, I touched the cord. Uh, so uh, Grandma's Boy is a really horrible look at uh, what the sort of public imagination of making games is. Right? You sit there with a the controller. That's not how it works. No, that's not how it works. Um, but there was a mention of Gamergate earlier. Um, my colleague Shira Chess uh, and I have talked multiple times about how we wish we would write a paper, but we never have time to write a paper, about how Gamergate was inevitable because most people have no understanding of how games get made and the connections between people within the industry and that the people that actually make stuff, right, know each other, they know journalists, they know streamers, YouTubers, like, these connections are really tight. And so when some players come along and are like, well, you're friends with that person and they reviewed your game and you're like, yeah, we all know each other. Like, yeah, that's just how it works. But Gamer, it was inevitable because most people don't understand where it comes from, right? That's old saying, nobody really wants to know how hamburger gets made because that's icky. And making games is this, this labor. And so... Um, <clears throat> You know, along came folks in production studies that were saying, well, let's tell people where games come from because it's, it's hard work and it takes time and um, not everything's great and it's never always clear, right? So John Banks's work looking about this interconnection between players and games. Uh, yeah. But... Other folks as well, right? So I, I had a slide, the slide up earlier. So Afrocare does really uh, uh, interesting work uh, in Ireland, looking at uh, the Irish uh, game industry. Uh, India, uh, so uh, Bart Simon uh, 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 and a bunch of other folks organized a, a special issue uh, about Canadian game production studies. Um, <coughs> uh, Brendan Keogh has done a lot of uh, work uh, in Australia. Uh, Jen Whitson's also out of Canada. Um, one of the things that amazes me, and so another reason I'm here, is that research on game, studying game making, happens in Canada, happens in Finland, right? It happens in Australia because their governments fund the research, and that's a good thing. United States, not so good at it. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I've, I've been pretty fortunate. But, um, but back to kind of the title, which is the importance, right? We're at this weird moment in the game industry, I don't want to say that, but in the world of game making, where it's kind of the last chance to talk to the folks that were making games early on and part of these industries, right? So uh, <coughs> Tom Bolstorff uh, and Braxton uh, Soderman have this new book coming out uh, from MIT Press uh, about uh, the Intellivision, and it's like, these folks like, are getting old, and this is a last chance to like get these stories. And, uh, and I don't really trust when somebody writes their own history because, man, they leave out a bunch of good stuff. Uh, and so I want the real story, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, thinking about role-playing games and like so the 
early creators of those games are pass passing on, right? Back to my death and dying game. Like, we're at this point where an entire generation of game makers are going to disappear. And it's our chance to talk to them. And it's really important. And talk to also young game makers, which is why studying game jams. Also, I love how many people show up at game jams that are working industry professionals. And they work with people who, like, are learning. And that's the best thing, because in the U.S., there's a whole lot of game makers that don't show up to game jams because their stupid NDAs cover everything they work on, and so they just can't go jam, and that's dumb. <laughs> I also have no qualms saying how I feel about these things. Um, so uh, I also think um, we can't just leave research about game making to these giant surveys that are put out once a year, every other year, right, to be our sole insight into what's happening, right? Going out and talking to people, working with them, watching them, right? Uh, that's how you learn uh, as much. These provide a lot of high-level information, but um, we have to learn about game making from talking to game makers. Um, so uh, how many of you have read Blood, Sweat, and Pixels? Okay, it's a decent book. Um, I have... Get a drink in me and I can talk some more. Uh, but it's a really interesting account of four different games being made. Um, but, <clears throat> right, as a reporter, um, right, this book, there are these moments. So I, uh, I'm not a reporter, right? Like, uh, uh, as a researcher, like, it's also my job, right? So reporters like to be like, here's data. And they step away from it like it's a bomb. And then they let other people draw conclusions from it. But I'm like, aren't you the smartest person about that data? Like, why don't you say something about it, right? And so as I read this book, I'm just constantly like, uh, please say something more because, like, the silence is so loud in the book and I just really want to scream. Um, and so uh, Lane Nooney's work about... Uh, Right, the people who sit behind. So especially, you know, like, I love Stardew Valley. Like, that is a game that I can, like, sit down and pick up and play any time. But when you read the story about it, you're kind of like, this person's partner, like, supported you for all of this. And you're the genius. <laughs> but, like, so much time and labor supporting right, this, this uh, uh, really fascinating game, like, just disappears, right? without those stories. Um, I also think it's really important to talk about game making, and I love uh, uh, when uh, Eric and Natalie were talking about the cost of the materials, right? The materiality, or like what would happen to the materials uh, after, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I have to go check out uh, the uh, Green Games Guide. Yes, uh, I knew it was GGG. Um, <coughs> Because I've been thinking a lot about, so I'm working largely in the non-digital space now, which is still digital because, like, you got to get your shit to the printer. <laughs> like, they don't want you to hand them, like, a pile of paper, your paper prototype. They really want some digital files. Uh, you know, and if you've got pieces, you've probably got CNC machinery that's doing that. Or Yeah, so it's complicated, and it's digital. Um, and once I started working on non-digital games, I, like, made the classic error of not having a production pipeline. And I went, I was like six months into it, I'm like, man, I gotta do this over again. And I totally know better than this because I've, I should have known better. But anyway, <clears throat> um, because, right, like even in these spaces, I'm really fascinated by how publishing, right, and so in non-digital games, you've also have manufacturing in there, but like how these systems work together, right? And, you know, uh, as digital game makers, you really are stepping into this space where, right, where is the money coming from and how does it get to you and who's taking how much off the top and, like, really thinking about the kind of platforms that you're a part of, right? Like, I look at YouTube and I watch my kids, like, scroll on YouTube and the kind of, like, content that's there and the remixing of content. I'm like, 
that's somebody else's look. This person's just narrating over something somebody else did, and my kids are sort of like, yep. And they're just like, oh, come on. Like, I pay attention to labor. Um, <clears throat> and so, like, I've been really thoughtful about um, the non-digital space, which is like, okay, I'm going to go kickstart my game. I'm going to go get it manufactured in China through Panda Games, and then I'm going to use, right, then let's not even talk about, like, uh, backer kit and all of these like tools that are meta tools to help all of this stuff happen and then it gets shipped to Amazon but there's actually another layer here because you have an Amazon fulfillment center right like and each layer like as a game maker you're like handing out your money to other people <clears throat> and I became really reflective on this right so particularly for non-digital games like during the pandemic because how like friends of mine were like, my game's in a shipping container. We don't know where it is. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yeah, right? Like, that's the consequence of this. Like, and so maybe if we're a little more reflective and thoughtful and like, I don't know, maybe I don't want to give my money to Jeff Bezos or whoever takes over Amazon after that. Like, trying to think through the, these money flows and being mindful about how we as game makers fit into global capitalism and we don't have to play the game that everyone else plays, right? Eric, you t like making games is about understanding systems and we construct systems that people then try to figure out and play with. And sometimes we forget that maybe we could probably play with the systems that we're a part of as well. Um, and so my last slide is really that like maybe being more reflectful about this. So this is like your friendly neighborhood game store. Um, and I love this quote, which is like a five-year path to a middle-class income, right? This guy's like, I'm going to figure out a way to like sell games and teach people how to like love this thing. I ain't going to get rich, like, but I'm going to figure out a way to do it that doesn't wreck my soul or my heart or my family. And like, maybe we can start to do that. And so for me, this is why, like, when I say why game production studies is so important right now is because, right, we are at a crisis point in global capitalism. And so, yeah, now is the time for workers to like think about their position and their power uh, and what they want and how we want to shape the world together. And so, yeah, like people be like, well, it's just games. I'm like, yeah, but we're really good. Like <laughs> your work on like neurodivergent folks, like, we're a bunch of weirdos. We're really good at breaking systems. And so like, let's think about that and use that power for good. So that's it. Thank you so much. But <laughs> here I am. Thank you, Casey, for your, for your talk. If you have questions, raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you. We'll bring a mic there in a, in a second. Um, but I have a question. Uh, so you've been here for six months. I don't know how much you've actually been able to talk to the developers, but is there something, because there's like some of the reasons that you came here were the expectations of the Finnish industry, but have there been any surprises so far? Yeah, so uh, uh, DevCon was in Tampere. Uh, in the fall, and uh, 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 that's a conference, yes. Yeah, yeah. By so, uh, industry <laughs> people, uh, and uh, it was really interesting uh, to listen to folks. Right, so I actually asked this question at the event because there was a whole lot of love in the room for publishers, and when I was doing my research for Developers Dilemma, and it was sort of the uh, sort of after that, when I was writing the book, it was like the early iOS days, and there were so many game makers that were running around going, fuck publishers, fuck publishers. <laughs> right? like, and to, to then be right, at DevCon and, and people being like, publishers are great because I don't have to deal with people. Like, uh, so like, to me, that's been a really interesting uh, thing. And the other one uh, really has been just like, um, um, I much more rarely hear here like, I can't talk to you about that, or like, shh, NDA. Like, there, there's a whole lot of like sharing and discussion. And then the other one that I said earlier, which is like, it's just great to see so many, um, you know, um, well known Finnish game makers that will show up at jams and just have fun. Um, and, and, right, that I think goes part and parcel with this kind of community. 
uh, and um, what was the the word that's like friend but not quite friend in Finnish? Tuttu. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So not tutu, but tutu. <laughs> Two different things. A question. So uh, you kind of mentioned like uh, the game studies of game making is not being uh, it's not being as seen as important as it was supposed to be back in the day. Uh, it wasn't being considered as like game studies or like the science and throughout the efforts of people like you, you have now brought attention to that for a long time and still bringing a lot of attention. Uh, I kind of wonder as like, what's your view as someone who has got, gone through the pain of bringing attention to a topic like that to people throughout the years? Is there something today in the games industry that you see as like, you know, a small subset of people are trying to raise some attention to, but big game companies or researchers or, you know, some very, very high ego scientists simply doesn't give a damn about. Is yeah. there something today that we need to look <coughs> for in the next years? What's the next battle? Yeah, well, basically? so uh, this is uh, so this is actually the, the Fulbright project that I'm working on and, like, the thing that I'm thinking about next. Uh, and, like, there are a lot of game makers that are trying to do something different, right? They're trying to break from some of uh, the existing molds. Um, they're making, I mean, game makers are making games about stuff that they never were before, right? Like, you th and it's not just like serious games, right? So my time, uh, my uh, colleague, Tom Apperly uh, at Tampora, he's like, Casey, isn't this just like, because I was talk I gave a talk about uh, this project, making games differently, and he's like, isn't it just serious games? And I'm like, Tom, I guess I could see that, but no, because like did making something differently is, sure, it's often about content, but uh, people, that are, people that are trying to do, to break the mold, are often making things that also break the mold, and I think they're often trying to help people understand where they're coming from. Because like when you're a weirdo, and I mean that in the like loving way. A good way, way. yes. Yeah. That uh, um, <clears throat> it's important to you that people understand where you're coming from, right? And so like if you look at um, like uh, queer game makers, zinesters, like right, like people who really don't give a heck what some gamer gator thinks, right? They're just tr making their thing and doing their thing. And so th that's what I'm really fascinated by right now. And where I'm the most excited is people who are like, let's figure out a way to do things differently. Yeah. Yeah, good. There is another question coming. Yeah, thank you, Casey, for your presentation. I have a couple of questions. The first one is like, where do you see uh, your, what do you do? And how do you call it? Is it a field? Is it an approach? Is it a research framework? Uh, where do you see this? Did it carve a niche in game studies, or like, because academic research has to kind of have a venue or something, it has to fit somewhere, right? Yeah, well, and right. So that was the. Uh, I think a lot of the researchers that that do this kind of work wind up sort of being, you know, one foot in game studies, another foot in design research, right? And so we end up spreading ourselves thin a little bit, or maybe focusing in one area for a while. Uh, uh, and sort of bouncing around. We, uh, and I think that's, in and of itself, kind of makes it risky work. Um, but it's totally, like, worth it, I guess, in the way that, like, yoga's worth it, maybe. Like, <laughs> it's uncomfortable, but, like, you do it because, like, you, you, you feel there's a value and a, a good to it. Um, uh, and so for me, like, that is, I study game making, I also make games, and for me that is because the best way to know how to keep talking to game makers is to m keep speaking that language myself. Um, and <clears throat> that, that question of like, <laughs> am I an artist or a designer or a programmer? And I'm like, what day is it? <laughs> like, which one <laughs> am I gonna put on uh, today? Um, but you know, some days I'm put on my anthropologist hat, and you know, some days, I like, I'm going to move to Finland, and my youngest is like, I'm going to punch you in the face. Like, <laughs> she was not real happy about that. But uh, um, I think 
when she hears me talk about what I do, she, like she, she knows why. But yeah. I'm gonna have to like let you ask a question after this. Uh, I have a final question for you, Casey. Uh, we know that like we both have been thinking about the next decades of uh, studying game makers. Mm -hmm. But what would be the because we don't have enough hands on the deck? What would be the simple things? that the practitioners themselves could do to help us maybe later to, to do the historical work? Stuff like this is really great because it's a chance for, like... So talks. Uh, t talks, but, like, also, like, when we get to, you know, so when uh, a game researcher shows up at an IGDA meeting, right, like, and you're chatting with them, I, like, the conversations between researchers and makers... Those are the best, and the best, uh, and what I wish, we're not going to steal anybody's game idea. We just want to, like, help practitioners learn from each other. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that, I mean, I think the best thing that folks can do is share and talk to us and, like, listen to our wacky ideas, and, you know, some of it would be like, whatever, but, like, that uh, having those moments to, to cross-pollinate, I, I think, are really the best. Thank you so much, Casey, for, for your talk, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.